now look to Professor Bomer to speak in favour of proposition. Mr President, ladies and gentlemen, I support the motion that British education perpetuates racism. British education perpetuates racism because it remains a largely unreconstructed system of education from colonial times, a system that was an instrument of empire, a system that, at both secondary and tertiary levels, was designed to train Britons for colonial service and, when exported to the colonies, was designed to train non-Britons to serve and to submit. In other words, a system that promoted racial differentiation and discrimination. Here I should clarify that as I see it, racism works through both overt and subtle means, through a politics of inclusion as well as a politics of exclusion, and that these modes support each other and work together. Racism works through cultural and national representations, and cultural representations manifest as symbolic violence which impacts on how people see themselves in the world and how they interact with one another. Any nation's education system, its curricula, its pedagogy, the social and cultural values on which it is based, is an expression of its history. And in Britain's case, that history is an imperial history. And the engine of an imperial history is race theory, a theory of us and them. A colonial or indeed Sometimes a post-colonial education teaches that the white man is the chief agent of history, its primary subject, and that all other peoples, Kiplings, fluttered folk, and wild, have either no history, as in Africans <coughs> have no history, or some history, as in Indians have some history, but a history of decline, a history of lesser importance, certainly, in relation to European history or British history, a sideshow to the main drama, which is the drama of Britain. Social and cultural formations, including educational systems and structures, play a crucial and privileged role in any imperial and national experience. They help with the important binding work of empire, or indeed neocolonialism, which is to say, persuading others to do your bidding, to submit to your control. Education is central to this, which is to say, not to put too fine a point to it, central to the process of disseminating race theories, often disguised as cultural or ethnic difference, of educating others to a secondary status in the world and in history in relation to free Britons. To make this case, we need only look at the what as well as the how of British education. For me, in particular, the humanities, my field. What is taught? in the main is the island story, the small island story, and how it is taught through what approaches lays emphasis on so-called British values, which are white, mainstream, often middle-class British values. This is brought out, for example, in Michael Gove's 2013 education reforms that bound English and history curricula to, explicitly, the island story. In relation to the island story, all other histories and literatures, and we might add all other geographies and sociologies, including those of Europe, are inferior, are deemed of lesser importance. I quote from the Citizenship Foundation website. In a school, teaching British values means providing a curriculum which actively promotes the fundamental British values of democracy, the rule of law, individual liberty, and mutual respect and tolerance of those with different faiths and beliefs. To which we might respond, as did anti-colonial activists and politicians across the 19th and 20th centuries, democracy for whom? And whose liberty? At what cost? The history of empire reveals that British liberty was always differentiated as the liberals J.A. Hobson and J.R. Seeley, amongst others, noted. Liberty was for Britons and some other white men, but not for others. Britons never, never shall be slaves. We sing when we sing rule Britannia, but what about others? Small wonder then that, as even some conservative politicians lament, 
imperial history is not taught in schools. For further examples, I could turn to institutional structures, to questions of institutional racism, but I believe that will be covered in a moment on my side of the debate. I will stick to content, and in particular the structure of content, as it illustrates the case powerfully. GCSE syllabuses since 1987 have warned against racial and gender bias, but have left it up to teachers to choose from a list of texts largely by white and male writers. Little corroboration for another world view, a map of the world centered anywhere else than in England there. Interestingly, these syllabuses are also culturally, which is also to say racially differentiated in at once subtle yet obvious ways. So that at least for the AQA exam board from 2004 until three years ago, poems from different cultures were taught as part of English or English language, whereas white writers or writers from the English literary heritage were taught as English literature. It's clear racial differentiation there. In the new syllabus introduced since 2013, even this different cultures element has been dropped. The politics of inclusion has given way to the polit a politics of exclusion. Prose from different cultures has been phased out in favor of modern works from Britain. One or two from black British writers, but most of the content is white. These are all racially inflected distinctions masked as cultural difference that encourage students to think either that their cultures stand at the center of the world or not, or are not as well regarded, not as influential. The same applies at a tertiary level. Literary ex excellence is seen as white. There are very, very few black writers taught in the English faculty, my faculty, on the pre-1900 syllabus. Teachers and students are chained to what one professor calls a ludicrously old-fashioned notion of a canon of set texts. For old-fashioned there, read, racially inflected. Small wonder then that, as recent research has shown, white British readers tend not to reach for works from other cultures when they read. They have been taught to read the world along racial lines, in part, I'd say, because of choices laid down as part of their education and how they were trained to see the world. Very similar points apply, as we've already heard, to the content of history syllabuses, where British history is always dominant, and white British teachers and lecturers, by and large, deliver the syllabus at both secondary and tertiary levels. The history of the rest of the world is taught in a limited way, in short modules, and interestingly, again, makes little reference to British imperialism. The same applies in art. If if one needs only to think of the objects of Western art that are gathered in the Ashmolean as against the objects of the art objects from other cultures that we find in the Pitt Rivers Museum. In sum, racism is a form of biopower, a way of regulating bodies by skin color and how they are represented. Our educational systems and structures perpetuate such biopower elevating some racial codings and downgrading others in history, in English, in art, in philosophy, in the sciences, in the sense of what is taught, who teaches, in what ways, and with what emphasis. Thank you very much.